So in February 2020, I had a big operation to remove a tumor that was growing in my small intestine. Now, you've all heard of the small intestine, but just to be specific, because I like to be specific. The small intestine is this structure that links your stomach to the lower part of your bowel. It's where the nutrients become absorbed from your food, and it has a diameter of 2.5 centimeters. My tumor had a diameter of four centimeters. Think of a snake that swallowed a space hopper. It had to go. So fortunately, I was under the care of a very talented surgeon and his team who were able to do the operation laparoscopically using keyhole surgery. And I remember him sitting me down and explaining to me how he would make a couple of holes in my belly, how he would go in with these laparoscopic instruments, um, and how he would cut out the diseased section of the small intestine and then join the two healthy ends together using either sutures or titanium staples. And I remember thinking, wow, titanium is really cool. <laughs> I hope he goes for that option. <laughs> and actually, that's what happened. So the operation was a success. Uh, before the operation, my small intestine was 1.9 meters long, and afterwards, it was 30 centimeters smaller. I now have a relatively small, small intestine but I boast a belly full of high-tech, state-of-the-art titanium staples. They look a little bit like this. So, um, I'm a science writer. I'm professionally curious. I ask a lot of questions. Uh, it makes me a good science writer, but it makes me a really annoying patient. <laughs> and um, I found myself thinking, wow. I mean, stapling your guts together. How did they come up with that? Uh, and the answer, it turns out, is really very, very wild. It's a story I'd like to share with you. So we need to go back in time. Uh, so in 1895, an American doctor called Robert Loud went on a hunting trip in the woods of Maine, New England, with a local Indian guide. Now, he remembered to take his rifle, but he forgot to take his medical kit. Rookie error. And when he fell over and he gashed his leg wide open, he found himself in a bit, bit of a predicament. Now, the guide wasn't phased. The guide just went off into the woods. He collected some bark and a handful of angry ants. Then he came back. He smushed up the bark to make a poultice, which he used to wash the wound. Then he grabbed the two sides of the wound and drew them together. And then he held up one of the ants. Now, the ants were angry before, but now they were absolutely furious. And one of these ants, it sank its jaws into the man's flesh, one on either side of the cut, effectively joining it together. Then with a flick of the wrist, he removed the insect's body from its head and then just tossed the lifeless torso to one side. So let's just pause for a moment and get our heads around this, okay? You're in you're in the middle of the woods, you've had a major accident, you're in serious pain, and your guide has gone off on one like some rogue Bear grills. He's stapling you with ants. And bizarre though it might seem, ants were actually the world's very first surgical staple. Um, and I'd just like to show you a picture of what this looks like. So this is a different wound, obviously, uh, but this is a picture uh, of an ant staple, and this is the ant before it's had its body removed. And you can guess what's coming next. This is the ant after it's had its body removed. And you can see it, it kind of works. It does the job, right? So they weren't high-tech or sterile, but they were sturdy and remarkably strong. They could last for days, and they could always replace them if you needed to, or you could hold the patient down. <laughs> And it got me thinking, right, you know, surgical staples, they're amazing. This is incredible. You know, if you're thinking of trying this, maybe on a, on a camping trip, <laughs> I would say to you, maybe think again. Uh, two reasons. Uh, the first one is uh, you, you could just go to the local A&E, just 
Just a thought, you know, leave the ants alone. Uh, and number two, you can't use just any old ant. It needs to be something like this. This is Echiton birchali, which is a species of ant found in Central America. Uh, it's a type of army ant. You'd need the big guy on the bottom right-hand corner here, but I should tell you he's about a centimeter long. He has these enormous scythe-shaped jaws, and oh yeah, they sting, so good luck with that. But it's remarkable to think that ants were the first staples, and it got me thinking about staples, surgical staples. They're these remarkable devices, these tiny slivers of metal. Surgeons use them every day. They save lives every day, but nobody ever really thinks about them. So if I was to ask you to think about some of the inventions that have shaped our modern world, you would probably say things like uh, the printing press or the wheel, maybe um, aeroplanes or cars or skyscrapers or dams. We, we tend to think big, literally, and we tend to overlook the little things. Things like ball bearings, stamps, Condoms, biscuits, screw tops, tampons, loo roll, gyroscope, pockets, fish hooks, tea bags, all of these amazing things. You can't have a smartphone without a microchip. You can't make a dress without a needle. You can't make a building without a nail. And it got me thinking about this, and I went off and I started doing some research about these small inventions that nobody's ever thought about. And I started writing about it, and I want to share a couple of the stories that I found with you today. And as I say, they're about things that either people have never heard about, or they're about things that people have never really thought about. So we'll start with this. Miss Schilling's Orifice. And I will be keeping it PG, Manchester. I will. Now, I'll tell you about her orifice in a minute. But first, let me introduce you to Miss Schilling, or Beatrice Tilly Schilling, as she's known. Now, she was born in the uh, 20th century in this country, in England. When she was 14, she bought her first motorbike, which she did up herself. Uh, as an adult, she started racing motorbikes professionally, trouncing the vast majority of all of her male competitors. Here she is looking totally badass in her biker's leathers. She had multiple degrees in engineering, one of them from right here in Manchester, where she was just one of two women on the course at the time. So she was this really, really smart woman in this very, very male world. And she was a trailblazer for inclusion and diversity. Now, when the Second World War came, she was walking at the Royal Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough where she was their principal technical officer doing R&D into carburettors. So the Battle of Britain was raging at this time. In the skies over the south of England, you had British pilots in their Spitfires doing battle against German pilots in their Messerschmitts, but there was a problem. So when the Spitfires went into negative G, when they either went into a nosedive or when they flew upside down, the engines would either misfire or temporarily cut out. Now, the German planes, they didn't have this problem. It was just the Spitfire, so it put the Germans at an advantage. And it was incredibly dangerous for the British pilots. Now, Tilly realized that probably the problem lay with the carburetor. And as the planes were doing these maneuvers, fluid was probably leaking from the carburetor into the engine. So whilst all of her male colleagues were come up with this, coming up with this major redesign, she came up with a quick, cheap, practical fix. And it was just a washer. Just a washer. We don't think about washers. They're in everything from washing machines to flat pack furniture, from, I don't know, satellites to the chairs that you're sitting on. And she designed a washer that looked like this. So it's basically just a circle with a little hole in the middle. And when it was retrofitted into the carburetors of Spitfires, it solved the problem. And it was officially called the RAE Restrictor after the place where she worked. Uh, but one of her male colleagues gave it a nickname. He called it Miss Schilling's Orifice. 
I mean, seriously? Which I think goes to show, really, just how little he knew about female anatomy. <laughs> or engineering, for that matter. I mean, can you imagine naming something, anything like that today? We would just never dream of it, would we? Anyway, um, the name stuck, and Tilly Schilling, I think, would have been completely fine with it. She toured around the RAF bases, she fitted these little washers into the Spitfire planes, and she made the lives of those pilots that bit safer. How about this? The paperclip. We're all familiar with them, but we never really think about them. So the thing about the paperclip is, it's like engineering perfection. It's like there was this divine light that shone down on the stationary cupboard, fusing the best of form with the best of function to make a device that is so simple, so elegant, and so brilliant, it's iconic. And this is the modern gem paperclip. And you can see it's got the classic single loop at the top and the double loop at the bottom. And it's that double loop that is really, really important because it grips our paper with all the tenderness of a mother holding her newborn. And yet, at the same time, all the confidence of a second-hand car salesman. <laughs> and paper clips are just... So cool. Loads of people claim to have invented them. There are literally dozens of patents relating to the paperclip. They all run to multiple pages in length, and the irony is that most of them aren't even clipped together. <laughs> and somebody who came up with an idea for a paperclip was this guy, Johan Vala. He was a Norwegian gentleman. And in 1899, he developed a paperclip that looked like this. Now, you can see this looks very different to the classic modern paperclip of today. It lacks that second turn, that second loop, so it makes it much harder to use. Now, he was awarded two patents for this, one in Germany and one in America, and shortly after that, a Norwegian encyclopedia described him as the paperclip's inventor, and the story spread. That's how he became known. And it didn't matter that there were patents that predated his. And it didn't matter that the gem paperclip had already been on sale in America for at least eight years. He became known as the paperclip's inventor, and Norway claimed the paperclip as one of their own. So it's a major biographical error, but I'm prepared to let it slide for one reason. And it's this. During the Second World War, Nazi forces invaded and then occupied Norway forcing the king at the time, Harkin VII, into exile. For the people who were left, it was a really dark and desperate time. With the battle raging all around them, communications faltered. In a spirit of defiance, they listened to foreign news broadcasts. They distributed underground newspapers, and they made little badges from Norwegian coins that had the exiled king's head on. And then when wearing those badges became banned, they started to wear paper clips. So in Norway, in Norwegian, paper clips are called binders. So now, instead of binding paper together, the paper clip stood as a symbol of a nation that was bound together, bound in unity, in the face of a violent aggressor that threatened their way of life, that threatened their democracy. And it was small, it was subtle, and it was brilliantly defiant. And people put them on their jacket pockets. They hooked them together, and they made bracelets, and they made necklaces. It stood as a, stood as a symbol of solidarity. And then, when the wearing of paper clips became banned, the paper clip still stood for hope. So who would have thought that such a small, and seemingly trivial piece of office equipment could acquire such a deep and profound meaning. Who would have thought that a tiny washer would help to keep British pilots safe during the Second World War? And who'd have thought that I'd be standing here in front of you today with a belly full of titanium staples? See, it seems to me that so much in life and really in history, we tend to focus on the big and the bold, when actually, in fact, so much of the impact on our lives comes from these small 
tiny things that are hiding in plain sight, that are underestimated and overlooked. And so here I am, standing here, wearing my two paper clips, one blue and one yellow, and I leave you with this. Because I have hope, and I really do believe, that sometimes small things can make a big difference. Thank you for listening. Thank you.